Okay, good morning everyone. Good afternoon for those uh, in other time zones. Good evening. My name is Mike Cecina. I am the product manager for some of the automotive products we're making here in the Mathrix uh, office in Novi, Michigan. I'm going to talk to you today about five cool things you can do with Powertrain Blockset. So as a quick reminder, uh, if you have any technical problems, you can contact the hosts uh, through the chat session in WebEx. If you have any technical questions that come up during the course of the presentation, uh, go ahead and type those into the Q&A session. So uh, yeah, if you can't see the slides or you're having trouble with the audio, uh, go ahead and use those chat sessions. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. What you see here is one of the vehicle reference applications for the powertrain block set. Uh, if you cannot hear the audio, please move the mouse to the top of the screen. Okay. So um, yeah, you can see the, the simulation is playing out here. We have um, a FTP 75 drive cycle that we're looking at. This is the city cycle in the US. So the fuel economy numbers that you're looking at here, this is the kind of simulation you would use to, to look at the instantaneous fuel economy, see how this does over the course of a drive cycle. Um, but what we did, I wasn't playing any tricks on you. I'm just playing back the video that I took real time on this. So it's a 40 minute drive cycle that we ran in about 25 seconds. So that means that you're about 100 times faster than real time. This is one of the values that Powertrain blocks at. We're trying to give you realistic fuel economy simulations that are much, much faster than real time. So what we'll show over the course of the presentation are that we have the ability to perform these fuel economy simulations at 50 or even up to 100 times faster than real time that you can explore and customize these pre-built reference applications, and that you can reuse the models throughout the development cycle. So for today's agenda, we're gonna start with an introduction to the product. It'll give you a sense of uh, when this product came out, what, what is it doing, what are the main aspects of this product that you might be interested in, and then we'll go through five different things that you can do with it. So what are cool about these things? So we have engine and control design people that might want to reduce time spent on hill, dyno, vehicle testing. For design optimization studies, this is a way that you can explore a wider search space. There is also the ability to plug in Simscape models to integrate multi-domain subsystem models into those vehicle systems that we're providing with powertrain block set. For subsystem control design, you can see how to validate controller designs through the simulation. And then we can do some hardware in the loop testing to validate those controllers virtually. So hopefully you'll enjoy some of these presentation points and let's go ahead and get started with the first point, the introduction. So this product was released in R2016B. The goal was that we wanted to just help engineers get started. You know, there would be certain groups that we've talked to that maybe they had a good engine model, but they don't have a rest of the vehicle model to plug that into. Or maybe it was a transmission team that they needed controllers for some of their engines or controllers for their models uh, of the motor. So we're trying to fill in the gaps for these teams and provide them the blocks that they need. But the, the models that we're providing, they're not just these black box S functions, they're open. So you can look under the mask, you can see exactly how they were built. Uh, you can read the documentation, learn more about them. And then as we saw in the beginning, they're very fast running. So not only are they good for fast desktop simulation, but they work with popular hill systems too. The main features that you get with this product are this library of blocks and some pre-built reference applications. So let's look a little more closely at those. For the blocks, you can see that we have a few different sub libraries here. We have pieces for the drivetrain. We have blocks for the energy storage. We have propulsion both for combustion engines as well as electric machines. We have a variety of transmissions. Then we have some vehicle dynamics and driver scenario blocks. So a typical user, they may start with the propulsion. They're gonna maybe pull together a bunch of components uh, like the turbocharger, the throttle body, the heat exchanger, and start putting those together for the engine model that they're going to do. Now, once they've got their engine model built, they can start doing some controls development for that. And then maybe they'll put their engine into a subsystem and start pulling in the other pieces they need, like tires, transmissions, maybe they're doing some electric modeling, so they'll have some machines and batteries. They can put that all together and now start running some kind of fuel economy analysis with this closed loop system. But luckily, you don't have to start from the ground up. That's why we have the reference applications. The idea here is that we provided four different vehicle models of different powertrain configurations, as well as some virtual engine dynamometers. So for the full vehicle models, we have a conventional powertrain, 
that could either be with spark ignition or compression ignition engines. We have a pure electric vehicle model. We have a hybrid electric powertrain configuration based on the multi-mode uh, hybrid Honda Accord. We also have another hybrid powertrain configuration that's similar to the Toyota Prius. So in addition to the full vehicle models, we also have these virtual engine dynamometers for both spark and compression ignition engines. And these are ways for you to do some kind of controls development and calibration activities with your engines. There are a lot of different ways people could be using the product. Uh, first, there could be groups that are doing system design optimization. So maybe they're looking at things like the gear ratios in their system. They want to find the optimal set of, of final drive ratio for their, for their vehicles. There could be teams doing controller parameter optimization. For example, maybe they're looking at shift maps and trying to find the optimal gains in some controllers. There are other groups that are doing the system integration testing as you come back up on the right side of the V diagram. Uh, so they want to bring their system into a larger vehicle and test it out and eventually they wanna to get to hill testing. Uh, so the product that we have here supports all of these kinds of use cases. So now we're gonna start hitting on some of the cool things you could do with it. We're gonna start with the engine control design calibration. Uh, so for each of these points, you'll see kind of where we are in those use cases that I just described. So here we're gonna start with some of the um, control applications that we could do with the engine controls. We'll talk about how you can use the virtual dynos to reduce time on the hill um, and on the dyno and vehicle testing as well. So in the very beginning, you saw that reference application for the complete vehicle model um, running a fuel economy simulation. This is the other kind of reference application we have. This is the spark ignition engine dyno. So we've included these dynos as a way for you to do different experiments uh, with your controls uh, on the engines themselves. So uh, what are these buttons on the bottom? These are how you would uh, run some of these experiments just by clicking on these. You can do a variety of things with the models. So for example, this one in the green, this is a way to get a steady state map from whatever engine and controller model you have plugged into the engine system here in the center. The next button would be for people that are working on model predictive control. It's a way to put some kind of transient data trajectories together for system identification purposes. The next button is for an automatic calibration activity that we have, and I'll show that in the next uh, few slides. And then the last button is something that we added in 17B, which just came out this morning. Uh, this is a way for you to automatically scale the engine. Um, the, the default engine that comes with this reference application is a 1.5 liter engine. You can scale it down or up by an entire order of magnitude. Uh, so that's a way for you to very quickly get some reasonable engine data if you don't have uh, any dyno data to start with. So what we're looking at here is the calibration activity. So when I click on that button there, it's going to start doing some experiments where it will set the engine speed for the dyno. It will command a torque for the engine. And now for the given engine controller that we have, those feed forward maps may not produce the torque that you actually are trying to command. And so our dyno controller will take over command of the throttle and the wastegate and try to tune those two inputs to get the commanded torque as close as it can without um, hitting the knock limit. So um, you can see it's now going to sweep through a bunch of speeds and commanded torques as it goes through a bunch of operating points one by one. And then when all said and done, out of this you get a new calibration map. In this case, we're looking at the wastegate area percent. So this is the new um, feed forward map that you could put into your controller. We just generated that automatically by clicking a button. How did we do that? We did that with state flow. So the idea is that uh, as you're designing engines, you have to design the calibration activity. And oftentimes groups will define that through a word document. It's a way to say, okay, here is the test procedure that I want the test engineer to execute. Well, rather than doing a word document, we're gonna make an executable test specification. So we're going to write out the logic, the heuristics inside of a state flow diagram so that we can test it virtually. The idea would be that um, you think you know you wanna calibrate the engine a certain way, um, but it's not until you actually start testing out that you may realize, okay, I forgot to measure some signal, or maybe the test that I've defined, it's going to take 18 hours to run, and I only have eight hours on the bench. So you'll, you can test out these ideas virtually before you go to the hardware testing. That way, when you're ready to do the actual hardware testing, you've got a refined procedure, and you have an initial set of calibration values to get started. But of course, the, the state flow charts that we've put in there are particular to our engine. If you want to calibrate your own engine, you can put your own logic in there just by creating your own state flow diagram. 
to um, to say here are the rules, here's the calibration method. So what is it they're calibrating? Well, inside of this dynamometer, the engine system is really just an engine controller in an engine plant model. You can put whatever you want in there. Now we have some different engine models that you can use from the powertrain block set. We have a mapped variant of an engine where you, if you have some dynamometer test data, you can put those lookup tables into the map. We also have the ability to create what we call dynamic engines. These are um, the kinds of blocks that we showed at the beginning where you're connecting in the turbocharger and, the, and maybe you want to make a dual stage turbo. Um, you can put those kinds of blocks together, make your own engine model in there. Or you could even connect to some kind of third party tool. You may have your own CAE engine model, say in GT Power, Ricardo Wave, one of those kinds of tools. You can plug that into the engine system and do those same experiments on your own uh, engine model in that way. So one way that could be valuable with the powertrain block set would be to do these kind of controls validations. You may want to have some kind of engine controller you've been working with in Simulink, and you want to validate it with your CAE engine model. So you could have all the blocks, um, all the vehicle model from powertrain block set, all the controllers that you're working on, and then plug in your engine model into this framework and test it out. Um, that's great. It's a good way to validate your controls, but sometimes those CAE models can be very, very long to simulate because there's a lot of physical detail in them, a lot of high frequency content. So we have the ability with this dyno reference application to create uh, a mapped variant of your original model. So remember we talked about this calibration experiment where it would, um, it would visit each of the operating points, the speed and the torque command points kind of one by one and find the combination of inputs that would get you to the commanded torque. Well, as you visit each of those points, it's measuring the steady state behavior of the engine. And therefore, you can use that data that you've gotten to create a steady state, quasi steady model from that data. So literally with the click of a button, you can convert your detailed design oriented model into a fast controls oriented model. So now you can hand over a table-based model for your controls team to do their development much more quickly, turn around some ideas. And then every time you have an update to your detailed design model, you can regenerate those maps. Is the map app accurate? So what we did was we tested um, the original CAE model connected to our vehicle model, our, our conventional vehicle. And then we ran the same um, FTP cycle with the mapped variant that we generated automatically from the dyno. And what we can see is that the mapped engine variant that we created was within a half a percent of the fuel economy of the original CAE model for the engine, but it ran 50 times faster. So this kind of gives us some confidence that this is a good way to do fuel economy studies by taking your design oriented models, then creating these fast running variants of them. So in this section, what we talked about was ways to automatically calibrate things like the throttle and wastegate. Uh, but that you could define and simulate some custom calibration procedures, which whichever control inputs you want to take um, into account with whatever logic or heuristics you want to put in place. You can also generate these engine maps from your CAE models with the uh, calibration activities that we have. Okay, for the next cool thing, we're going to talk about design optimization studies and how they can help you to explore a wider search space. In the beginning, we showed that the, the vehicle simulations can be 50 or even 100 times faster than real time. What that means is that you can now do efficient optimization. It allows you to look at more drive cycles, to look at more design parameters, or use fewer resources to get those answers. And you can also do these kinds of analyses on a laptop. You don't need a super high powered computer to run these kind of simulations. And we have things like the Simulink Design Optimization User Interface so that you don't even have to have a strong coding background to do them. So let's take a look at an example here. This is the architecture for the multi-mode HEV reference application that we have in the powertrain block set. This is based on the hybrid Honda Accord. Um, you can see the, the SAE paper that they published with their architecture. The idea is that it has a few different operating modes depending on which of the actuators are in line. So for low power, low speed, you're just going to have the motor driving the wheels directly. As you start to increase the power demand on the vehicle or start increasing the speed, Eventually, the engine will kick on to run the generator, providing additional power for those uh, electric motors to run the tires. And then lastly, when you get to high speed modes or high power modes, you can also engage this engine clutch to now have a parallel uh, engine power split mode. 
So let's do some design optimization with this architecture. Uh, typically, you'd want to do something like maximize fuel economy. And in this case, we're going to combine two different drive cycles to get this mile per gallon equivalent, meaning we're going to have a weighted average of the city and the highway cycle uh, numbers from those two drive cycles. What is it that we're varying? Well, we're looking at five different control parameters. These are parameters that were used for the, um, for the operating modes for the control strategies uh, here. And then one hardware parameter, we're going to look at the final drive ratio for that vehicle. And lastly, we're going to just use our, our PC. I have a simple ThinkPad here. I don't have a, a computing cluster at my disposal. I just have my, my laptop. But I'm going to use Simulate Design Optimization in a parallel computing toolbox to speed this up. So with the Simulate Design Optimization, you can simply say, OK, this is the model I want to run. These are the parameters that I want to change. This is the signal of the model that I want to optimize. And then you can start to speed things up, uh, for example, by using accelerator mode, by turning on the fast restart so you don't have to recompile your model every time that you run a simulation. Uh, if you want to run a parallel uh, computing just on your laptop, you can uh, take advantage of the multi-cores just by checking a box here in the parallel options. And if you know that there is a certain timeout you want to keep in mind, maybe after three minutes, you know the simulation should be done or there's a problem, so you can set a timeout to keep things running smoothly. So what happens? Uh, so I can start with a given uh, contours for my control regions, a given hardware ratio. I let it run on my laptop overnight. I come back in the morning. I can see how the fuel economy has kind of changed over some of these iterations and how the different input variables have been uh, changing over those iterations. And now I get some new control boundaries. It's kind of shrunk some areas and uh, changed the dimensions of other. And I've got a slightly different final drive ratio, and I've squeezed out another couple percent of fuel economy out of this vehicle. But is the design that you came up with good? How do you know how sensitive it is to that particular design that you chose? Well, you can also use the Simulink Design Optimization tools to do a sensitivity analysis. So for example, we could look at some of the parameters in the vehicle, like the injector slope, throttle bore, barometric pressure, vehicle mass, or wheel radius. I can define different distributions for those, maybe a normal distribution, maybe a uniform distribution. And then I can create a Monte Carlo analysis where I, I scattershot a bunch of random points throughout the design space. And I look to see what kind of impact it has on the, on the fuel economy numbers. Now, again, you can speed up the performance using something like Parallel Computing Toolbox. If you have a distributed computing server, you can do something like that on the cluster. Um, you can also run some scripts if you want to do some simple scripting for uh, running parallel jobs. We, in 17a, introduced the parsim command, which handles all the setting up and the initialization of that pool for you. So it's much, much, much easier to create those parallel scripts. So what do I get out of this? Uh, well, I can start with the city cycle, and I can see that there's a fairly significant variation in the fuel economy from 24 up to 33 miles per gallon, depending on the combination of those parameters. And I can look at something like the, the um, tornado plots here to see which of those parameters has the greatest impact on the fuel economy. I could do the same thing for the highway cycle, and I can see it's a much, much lower variation this time for the fuel economy, um, but that there is a high sensitivity to the barometric pressure. So maybe that means my controller should be accounting for those kinds of parameters. So with the design optimization studies, we saw that you could um, set up these studies with minimal effort, you could enable the parallel computing just by checking a box from SDO. Uh, you could perform these design optimization studies on your laptop even, just running them overnight. And then you could perform these Monte Carlo studies to analyze the sensitivity of your system. OK, cool thing number three. Let's talk about Simscape and how you can use it to integrate multi-domain subsystem models into Powertrain Blockset. So first, let's talk about the relationship between Powertrain Blockset and Simscape. Uh, there's overlap in what these tools can do depending on what your interests are. You could build some of these kinds of models using either approach. Now, Powertrain Block Set has a, a lot of focus on the engine modeling. We've done a lot with the, the engine plant model and a lot of the engine controls work in there. Simscape is a much more multi-domain tool. It has a much broader reach. Um, so people that are using Powertrain Block Set, they're typically the kind of people that are doing analysis work on some existing hardware. Maybe they're, they have some data on hand that they'd like to use. So they're going to uh, be interested in a lot of the empirical models that we have inside of Powertrain Block Set. 
Simscape users are often doing kind of uh, some design work uh, with first principles equation based modeling. The causal models are, are really great for setting up complex networks of models. Um, but of course, you can do data driven analysis work with Simscape. And of course, you can do equation based design work with Powertrain Blockset. It's just a matter of the different emphasis of the two tools. Now, you can use them together in a lot of different ways. Uh, so, for example, here you could start with the vehicle reference application from Powertrain Blockset and then customize it with some kind of transmission or drivetrain that you built with uh, the Simscape components. Maybe you have some kind of Simscape driveline. You want to put together some kind of drivetrain for, for the system here. Or maybe you want to go down into the transmission and create some kind of custom transmission using the clutches and the planetary gears. And you really like the A-causal modeling of Simscape to do that kind of approach. Well, you can create different variants inside of the, the subsystems for powertrain block set, and then you can switch between them. So it's a way for you to incorporate those different um, subsystem models into the reference application that we have. So powertrain block sets providing this testing framework for your Simscape models. You can take it a step further. In this example, we, we now started adding some kind of a cooling circuit to the, to the system. Um, so powertrain block set doesn't include a lot of the, um, the thermal fluid uh, type models. That's where Simscape would come in. So we started with one of the Simscape fluid uh, demos, the engine cooling system, and we added it as an additional subsystem to the, the passenger car portion of the reference application from powertrain block set. So what you see here is the Simscape circuit for doing the cooling here. The engine component that you see here, this is taking in the energy from the fuel minus the mechanical energy that was sent out uh, through the shaft. And therefore, it's all the waste energy that's getting dumped into the cylinder uh, or into the block, the engine block. And so we need to reject that heat. So where does the heat go? It goes through both the coolant loop and the oil loop in the rest of the model that you have here. And so this is a way for us to test maybe the radiator design, maybe the oil coolant heat exchanger to see as I drive over a variety of different drive cycles, can I keep the temperature of the cylinder wall within the acceptable limits? Okay, so this is um, one area where you can do kind of the design work within Simscape, test out your system, and then use the, the vehicle framework from Powertrain Blockset to exercise it in a variety of different test conditions. So in this short example, we showed how you could create multi-domain subsystem models with, some, with Simscape and then incorporate them into the system level models from the powertrain block set. And lastly, you can validate the subsystem performance with that closed loop simulation to make sure it meets your needs. Okay, next cool thing, we're gonna talk about subsystem control design and how you can use it to validate those controllers. So imagine you're a motor control engineer. The kinds of problems you might be faced with were things like, I have a motor controller. Does it produce the desired performance? What are the interactions between that motor and the rest of the vehicle? And can my motor controller operate under the, those more extreme load cases? So we're going to use some model-based design to answer those questions. So different motors uh, for different needs. So if you're doing something like a system optimization, you're looking at a fuel economy. For that, you just want a fast running motor model. You maybe want to have some kind of simple parameterization with some data that you've taken from an um, uh, electric machine dynamometer, maybe. You can get that data into an empirical model, some kind of lookup table model that doesn't include all the dynamic effects, but includes the quasi steady behavior that you need. Those are very fast to run, so those are good for system optimization. However, you may be wanting to do some kind of subsystem control design. So here now, those control interactions with the plant are much more important. You want to have higher accuracy and include other effects in there, for example, uh, nonlinear saturation effects. So some of those kind of nonlinear saturation models can come into play for the controller design here. Well, how do you get those kind of models? Uh, one way would be to take some kind of FEA simulation or maybe some data from a dynamometer. And you can obtain these nonlinear uh, relationships between the flux and the current. When you have those tables, now you can put them into a model to create something uh, that we're labeling here as a flux-based uh, PMSM model. You can capture those effects and now do some, some design that includes them. Now, um, you could build your own model to do this. Um, in 17b, we introduced this flux-based PMSM model into the powertrain block set directly. Um, but the idea is that uh, regardless of where you're getting these, these um, higher fidelity motor models, you can bring them into the powertrain block set and test them there. 
So maybe you have some subsystem variants that are based in Simulink. Maybe you use Simscape for them. Maybe you have an S function for your other uh, motor model. But you're going to use uh, powertrain blocks as a way to, to validate those uh, components. Now, to begin, we're going to just do some simple tests. We had a mapped motor model that we were using earlier with some kind of supervisory controls and a motor control. And I want to say, when I bring in now this higher fidelity nonlinear saturation motor model, can the supervisory controller still behave as expected? And so we run some, some fuel economy simulations with the mapped motor and with the detailed motor. And it looks like, yes, it's following the drive trace in both cases. Uh, the engine's going to kick on in one speed. Uh, oh, careful of muting mics, thank you. Um, so the engine may kick on uh, at different times depending on the current flow through those two different motor models. Uh, but by and large, it looks like the supervisor controller is handling things and that we're following the drive cycle. Uh, now I want to look a little bit more closely at the motor model, uh, for the motor controller model to make sure it's meeting the, the, the needs. So when I zoom into some of the time traces here, I can see that the actual torque command is matching the uh, the the uh, commanded torque quite well. We have a lot of transient behavior here, um, but even in that transient behavior, the motor is able to respond in time to that uh, commanded torque. And that's true over a variety of different motor speeds. So things look great, um, but my colleague reminds me, well, you know, FTP 75 is, is a fairly um, simple drive cycle as far as the speed's concerned. You should try it on a more aggressive cycle. So uh, I look at the US 06, and lo and behold, she's right. There is a, a drive cycle here that shows that there are instabilities in my motor controller. So as we get to some of these higher power areas, uh, the motor controller is not able to, to meet the demand. It's, it's going unstable. So what's happening? When I look more closely at my motor controller, I can see the different phases of it here. I have a flux weakening controller to make sure I'm not producing too much back EMF in the motor. And then I look at the IDIQ commands that come out of there. In my current controller that you're seeing here, that portion of it is using a PI control on the IDIQ errors. But the problem is I had um, the same gains throughout uh, my motor model. But now that I have this nonlinear plant model from the motor, I can't use the same gains for all operating points. So I'm going to include something called dynamic gain scheduling, where the, the gains for that PI controller are going to depend on where I am in state space. Now, once I do that uh, with the dynamic gain scheduling, now I can see that the motor controller is stable. It's able to handle those high power regions and still provide the, the commanded torque well with the, the plant model. So it looks like I was able to identify a problem and correct it with that kind of a, a validation. So with this example, we showed how you can easily integrate your detailed motor and controller models into the system model from Powertrain Blockset, how you can test the interactions between the motor and the controller with the rest of that closed loop vehicle model, and how you can verify the subsystem controller meets those system level requirements. Okay, home stretch. We're gonna look at some hardware in the loop testing now. We're gonna see how you can validate the controller virtually with Hill. Now. Again, let's go back to the same uh, model that we've been using here. Uh, the important point is the same model. We're not going to have a different model for Hill than we did for the fuel economy analysis or some of the controller validation. It's all the same set of models I've been using throughout. That's because we have the ability to have both the, the speed that we need and the, the right amount of fidelity in those models to do those kind of controller simulations. So I'm going to start with um, a Speedgoat Rapid Control Prototyping System. So this is going to pretend to be my ECU. I don't happen to have an ECU with me, so this is going to be kind of like a virtual ECU that we're going to, to use for the supervisory control. So the hybrid controller gets deployed down to that real-time system. Now I'm going to use another Speedgoat box to do the, the rest of the real-time testing. So this is my hill machine that's pretending to be the vehicle. So I'm going to flash that, that vehicle onto that real-time system and I'm going to connect a CAN cable between the two to have their, their data interface. So uh, here's a quick video to show you what that looks like in real life. So you can see in the bottom right, this is the host PC that I'll be doing my work on. It's just another ThinkPad that I'm working on. On the top right, we have the plant. This is the real-time system for doing the, the hill work on that, that uh, vehicle model. On the top left is the controller. This is that kind of uh, emulator for the control signal that we have. 
Now the CAN cable that you see highlighted here, that's connecting the signals between the plant and the controller. And then those two real-time machines, they come together here to this ethernet switch that creates the, the local network to connect to that host PC. And then you can see these cables come back through the adapter and then they connect into the host PC where I'm running the Simulink Real-Time Explorer. So what can you do with that Real-Time Explorer? You can look at different parameter values impact on that simulation in real time. Uh, so the Simulink Real-Time Explorer allows you to, to hook into different parameters in your model, change them, and then see the effect as the simulation is running. Uh, you can also use some of, some of those Simulink Real-Time APIs to save off different calibrations and compare them directly from MATLAB. So in this last example, we showed that you can use Hill to validate the control algorithm before you have physical prototypes available using the Hill testing, and that we reuse the same vehicle models throughout that entire V cycle. And you can parameter or you can tune those parameters in real time. And lastly, set up the Hill test in just a few hours. So these things are really designed for Hill testing. The engineer that created the lab that you saw there, um, that was set up in just a matter of a half a day or so. So in summary, uh, we showed how the powertrain block set can be used to perform a variety of different model-based design activities, all with this kind of seamless integrated environment. We looked at a variety of different use cases here from engine control through design optimization and as well as the controller design, Simscape modeling and hill testing. So finally, the value proposition we showed in the beginning was that you have the ability to run these simulations at uh, 50 or even 100 times faster than real time that you can explore what's in those reference applications and customize them for your particular needs. And then you can reuse those models throughout the development cycle. So my name is Mike Cicina. I'm the product manager for Powertrain Blockset. I'd be happy to take any questions you have. You're also welcome to reach out through our typical customer service or tech support lines. And we also have Brad Heeb, one of the product specialist application engineers here in Novi to help. So at this time, um, I'll take any questions you have.